So let's, let's sort of apply this back to where we started with that binge eating disorder thing, okay? Do you remember the description that the DSM-5 had? And now that we've sort of built this framework of human experience, now we can say something more to the person than just looking up verses on gluttony, okay? We can say more to the person than just simply quoting the fruits of the Spirit regarding self-control. Though, I, I really want you hear, to hear me say, those are two really rich themes if you approach them dynamically. Okay? If you approach them with a vision of, of the human experience that's as deep as the Bible's is. Okay? So, binge eating disorder. Now, I'm going to walk through each one of these things. And I'm going to talk to you about at least things from my own experience as I've, as I've counseled people who would have been diagnosed with binge eating disorder had they gone to a psychiatrist. And talk to you about some of the things that I worked through with them regarding what they were believing and thinking, regarding what they were wanting and therefore feeling, and then regarding some of their commitments and choices. And in that way, you have a rich approach to helping someone. <laughs> So, with the cognition, a lot of this, for some of these guys, it was based on an understanding of life that's, that's sort of laced with, with entitlement to find pleasure, to find rest in greater measures than he is, is having it. In other words, he believed that life ought to be giving him more rest and peace than it was giving him. Okay. And, and, and how did he come to this? I mean, there, our beliefs, it's very complex how we form our beliefs. Okay? But we're going to talk in this session, too, about how culture in some way informs our beliefs. right? And we grow up in a culture where, especially the gentleman I'm thinking of, he's, he's of the millennium or millennials, right? Which, those poor guys, we, we, people rip on millennials too much, okay? So I don't want to add to it, okay? But millennials, but I'm going to. So, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> millennials are wonderful. I mean, there, there's so many qualities about them that are good. One of the potential weaknesses of the way that the, the upper generation raised the millennial generation is by, by painting for them a world that, that's idealistic. They can attain anything they want. They can attain anything they want without really having to make the hard sacrifices required to do that. That's the general cultural tone that, that one generation set for the younger one. So I'm not ripping on millennials. I'm ripping on all of you who raised the millennials. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but my point is that, that knowledge, that, that belief perspective has consequences as an ingredient in what often goes into binge eating disorder. The, the, and, and addressing that gets, gets at deeper issues than merely talking about the food that they're actually putting in their mouths. So that's one belief. May, here's some more beliefs that I've seen. Perhaps they believe others are different than they are, than he is, and thus they isolate themselves from their advice. I've, I've noticed that someone given to sort of morbid overeating, they have, they have a tendency to believe that they have different bodily needs than other people have. It's sort of a, it's this interesting sort of self-justifying mechanism, but they begin to believe, well, you don't understand because your body doesn't need as many calories as mine. Or you don't understand because you were born skinny and you're just naturally skinny, right? Or you don't understand because, and, they, and some of these guys can begin to build a framework, okay, in that way. By the way, all these things I'm mentioning aren't true of everyone struggling with overeating, okay? I'm just giving you suggestions and ingredients that can go into one particular individual's experience. And your job, by the way, if you're doing counseling and if you're doing any personal ministry, you have to know that one person's experience of it. I should have said this earlier, but I'm going to say it now. Did you know that not all depressed people are depressed for the same reason? It's true. Did you know that not all people who use pornography use pornography for the same reason? Okay? There's always a common thread of sexual lust, but there's other elements that go into it. And did you know that not everyone grieves the same way? Okay? So, so I'm just pointing that out right now to say to you, 
you, th there's, a, there's a huge quality or, or a front-loaded quality from the proverb we started out with about a man of understanding drawing out the, the depths of the heart means that you have to understand the person in front of you more than you understand the issue that they're struggling with. Does that make sense? So that's why, I'm, that's just my caveat as we go through this sort of binge eating disorder thing and I'm giving you these facets, I'm just ex explaining to you different things that have been ingredients in different persons' experiences. More beliefs. He can also believe that he's beyond hope of changing. He can have a deterministic understanding of not only his behavior, but of who he is. In other words, this is who I am. I can be no other. If you've ever gotten caught in certain habit, if you've ever been, if you've ever been sort of like depressed for a long time, the, the same mechanism can sort of go on too, where you just kind of think this is uh, this is uh, it's impossible for me to change. Okay. Maybe he has certain theoretical beliefs about God loving him. Okay but he does not functionally believe that God can love someone as disappointing as him. Okay? That's a key ingredient for some of these guys. So in other words, they know, they know they're visually unappealing. They know that it's shameful to get up in the middle of the night and stuff their faces. They know that other people aren't commonly doing things like that and yet they go to church sitting next to all those people and they're hearing about the same God and what can happen is they can disjoint the theoretical view of God that they hear from Scripture and their actual functional views of, of God to them, right? So part of, the, part of helping someone in that situation is helping them see that it is, God is never after theoretical belief. God is never after you just signing a creed. God is after you believing God as God for you, right? The gospel has to be personally received. And so when they are given healthier beliefs, more accurate knowledge of how the world should work, everything from the first thing I said, like, look, the world, the world doesn't owe you a pleasurable, perfectly safe, and insulated existence. In fact, what, what, what might you cite from Scripture to correct that cognitive framework? Yeah, through trials and, and difficulty. The, 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 the place that comes to my mind first is Ecclesiastes. Guys, Ecclesiastes is one of my favorite books for counseling people because it's so raw and it's so real. And it says that this life is going to be marked with difficulty and striving, and it's going to feel like futility, okay? So if you judge the value of your life based on your relative enjoyment and pleasure, guess what the Solomon discovered about that? It doesn't work, okay? So you're undermining those deeper beliefs and replacing them with more accurate view of the world from Scripture. Or, and then the last one we'll correct in terms of the cognition is the last thing I mentioned there, like his view of God for him. Does God wait for you to clean yourself up to a certain level in order to offer you the help? That's what he's thinking, functionally. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that the psalmists is what the psalmists cry out. You know how many times in the Psalms the phrase, I am poor and needy, comes up? I am poor and needy. That means I am utterly unable. I'm utterly unable. You have to meet me entirely. I can't meet you halfway. You must come help me. That's a corrective that he needs. Okay. Let's talk about affections. What, what's an ingredient in terms of his desires or, and his feelings that are going into this, this binge eating disorder? He might use food to pacify difficult emotions. A lot of the guys that I've worked with, that's exactly what they're doing. They're having feelings that they don't like. The, for, 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 mo for most of these guys, the emotions are triggered by some difficulty, some, some, some hardship. Some of them were so, some, sometimes abuse, sometimes just you know, being dumped and having a really difficult time relationally. But, but the point is, they have all these negative emotions, and instead of, instead of expressing them before the Lord, 
those negative emotions, which is what you were designed to do. Did you know that? Jesus modeled that in Mark 14 that we saw. Instead of expressing them in submission to the Lord, what do they do? They try to avoid them and pacify them. It, it's, it feels a lot better to eat a pepperoni pizza than to be sad. Okay? I'll take a pepperoni pizza any day over sad. Okay? So you have to bring that corrective. You have to help him see what is it that you're really wanting here. It's more than just the taste of food. It's what that taste of food represents to you. It's this, it's this pacification of these emotions. Okay? Or perhaps he's fearful of others or embittered towards them, and his binge eating gives him the peace of mind that comes from this sort of isolated pleasure. Okay? So in other words, when, when, you, when you sit around people who are not like you enough and you're telling yourself what he's telling himself about who he is and how he can't change, then you kind of get this like attitude towards other people and you get embittered towards them and then it just reinforces the behaviors that isolate you from them. Okay? That needs to be addressed often in these situations. How do you think he might feel about himself? We talked about things he was believing about himself. What, how do you think he might feel about himself? Yeah, he might hate himself. Self-loathing. Did you know that self-hatred is sin? Did you know that? I'm not saying that from a self-esteem framework, like, oh, you need to think you're the greatest thing. Don't think bad thoughts about yourself. No, that's not the framework we're approaching it from. Why is self-hatred sin? That's right, because you're rejecting the derivative value of who you are a, a derived from who God is. That's a big part of it, but there's more to it too. Self-hatred is usually us me- measuring ourselves by some earthly standard that we don't amount to, and then we get mad at ourselves for that. Okay. So in other words, if you think about what you feel self-loathing for, it's usually because you're not skinny enough, you're not attractive enough, you don't have enough talents, and so you feel bad about yourself because you see other people that walk around with perfect heads of hair, driving Mercedes Benzes, and going where, traveling wherever they want. Okay, And what you're doing there is you're worshiping an earthly standard of what attraction and beauty is, and you're just throwing your temper tantrum because you don't have it for yourself. right? So... Self-hatred is a part of it. And you have to correct him with the vision of God's love that is better than all those other systems of measurement. Okay? In terms of God, how do you think he's feeling towards God? Oftentimes, they have no real feel for God. There's the, the, he, he feels nothing but guilt, in fact, when he thinks about God. And it's because of this desire that, again, feelings reveal desire. So what's the desire? The desire to be clean. But how's he thinking of this value of being clean? Is he thinking about it in a gospel-centered way? Or is he thinking about it in some other way? Because the the gospel promises clean, being clean, uh, cleansing, right? But, But he would rather have... He, 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 he's still assuming he needs to clean himself up to some point in order to be able to approach God. So he feels suspicion f- uh, from God. He feels uh, antipathy. And then that results in certain volitional things in his experience that you have to address. The result is he gives in to patterns of eating. The choice not to give in on any given evening to binge becomes more trouble than it's worth, okay? Okay. This is how habits are formed. Did you know this? Whenever you take an action, you make that same action incrementally easier to do the next time. That's how a habit is formed. That, that, by the way, God designed you that way, and that's a beautiful design in one sense because that's how you buckle your seatbelt every time you get in the car. Anybody play the piano here? Nobody plays the piano here? Okay, everyone's like, "Eh, I'm a piano player. That is a glorious habituation. What you've done is you've repeated certain motions with your fingers enough to where that action has actually sort of mapped itself neurologically on your brain. And so you don't have to think, okay, finger one, three, and five, where's middle C? You don't have to, you don't have to consciously think about it, it just flows out of you, right? 
But that's true of all of our actions too. You've done this before. Around the holidays, when you have dessert every night because you're with family, and then you go home from the holidays, and all of a sudden you're like, all right, Monday night, where's my dessert? And you just kind of get into it. It makes it easier the next time to do that, to have those expectations there. So you have to address that when you're counseling someone. He, he is responsible for his choices in a given moment, even though we acknowledge that there is a habituated pressure that makes it seem more automatic for him in the moment. Okay? So don't, so don't just say, yeah, just stop eating, as if he has the ability to do that. You have to help him think through what contextual things can we change for you that's going to make that behavior less automatic for you, to undermine it. Does that make sense? So, we could go into a lot more there, guys, but I want to make sure that we reserve time for the last part of our outline. If you have more questions, I will certainly take those in the Q&A time. Now I want to talk about the context of the heart's responses. So we've talked about how the heart responds in terms of its internal framework here, okay? Now, I want to zoom out. Oh, yeah, we've talked about how the heart responds. We've talked about how either of these two principles are motivating that response. But now, I want to talk about the contexts of the response. Because let me just do an introductory thing here first. This thing is, uh, keeps tricking me. Let's do this. The heart is always responding to the world around it, okay? There's a context to which it's responding. It's, you're, you're not in a vacuum. This dynamic heart model can't happen in a vacuum. You can't have beliefs or desires or take action without that being in response to or regards something external to yourself. And so in counseling and in personal ministry, you have to pay really close attention, not just to the, how the heart responds, to, but to what it's responding to. Okay. So for instance... If you have two teenage girls, both of whom get pregnant out of wedlock, and one was raised in a Christian home, in church, with plenty of models of good marriages around her, with a biblical ethic, sexual ethic taught to her, and the other girl, exact same situation, pregnant out of wedlock, was raised in an environment where she was in a single parent home, in a community where it was almost exclusively single-parent homes, raised outside of church, raised in a culture where sexual activity was sort of the norm, do you treat those two ladies the exact same way? No. Does anybody want to say yes? There's a sense in which it's yes, and there's a sense in which it's no. The sense in which it's yes is sin is sin, right? The, 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 the morality is not flexible, okay? Sin is sin. On the other hand, the external factors to which the heart was responding were, were very, very different. And so, just like I said, not everybody gets depressed in the same way, and not everybody looks at porn for the same reason. The same would be true of this example. And the way you find, the, part of what you need to look at in getting to the dynamics of responses, considering the external environment. And so that, those, that external environment, as you see in this diagram, is just four main components of human context, okay? God, self, others, and circumstances. So I'm actually going to start, I think, with, we're going to end with the most important one, and that's God. So we're actually going to start with circumstances, which I think is the reverse of your outline here, okay? Oh, I see what I did. Nope, let's start with God. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I guess we got to start with God. Okay. Okay. Is that part of the drill? Okay. It's part of our training of active shooter. That would be freaky. I should never say active shooter when actually speaking in a context like this. I'm sorry. All right. So basically, friends, we have God as the main context of the heart. God made us, as we've already said, 
God made us to respond to him, okay? So the most important aspect, the most important context of the heart response is God. I, you know, A.W. Tozer in his Knowledge of the Holy, I think the opening line says something like, what passes through your mind when you think about who God is is the most important thing about you. There's a lot of truth there. God, how we perceive God, puts shape to all the other relationships that we're going to go over here, okay? It puts shape to the way we understand ourselves. It puts shapes to the way that we relate to other people. And it puts shape to the way we respond to the circumstances of life. So remember, your heart was made to worship God. We talked about the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. What's the second greatest commandment? Jesus even said, the second is like unto it. It, it, It's a natural outflow of the first. And that is to love others as you love yourself. So the implication is, is that when the heart is worshiping God according to its design, it will respond rightly and functionally in all other ways too. So this is kind of, to use a fancy term, This is sort of the meta-relationship. This is the relationship that determines the shape of all other relationships. And the dynamic heart, friends, this is a key point I want you to get just before we get into the particular questions there. The dynamic heart was made to imitate God's. That's the main thing I, I need you to get at this point. It was made to imitate God's heart. As people respond in faith, as we've, as we've established, they take on the shape of his character in the way they think, in what they want, and in the choices that they make. So all people, all people imitate God in the structure of how they're designed, believers and unbelievers. I often get the question, can you do biblical counseling for an unbeliever? My question is always a happy yes. Okay? Because they're made out of the same stuff. Every unbeliever has this structure of personhood to them because they're reflective of the personhood of God. So everyone imitates God in their structure, but only believers imitate God in the content of that structure, in the, in the character, in the expression of that structure. Does that make sense? So, when you're working with people, Part of what you're thinking about, part of what you're thinking about is, is the way this person's responding to their problem, or the way the person is responding in that particular relationship that's bothering them, or the way this person is responding to this tragedy, is it reflective of how God would respond, okay? Or, or, or God's character, God, the shape of him. So, Here's a couple questions that I'm leaving you with in each of these categories of the dynamic heart that kind of help you get to the bottom of what someone might be thinking in these regards. You really need to know, in terms of cognition, what do they believe about God? Is he important or irrelevant to the way that they're talking about their problem? Friends, In my ministry, I counsel mostly Christians. I I do counsel some unbelievers. But but what amazes me is that even Christians who walk with the Lord often, when they're unloading on their problem to you, they never mention God at all. Okay? Why is that? It's because they have not thought through what the knowledge of God has to do with their actual experience in life. Okay? So, by the way, don't, don't blast them for that. I noticed that you didn't mention God at all, right? And then, they're, then, then you're adding shame to it and it just everything blows up, okay? But my point is, I will say to them, hey, man, that, thank you for sharing that with me. That felt, that, that I know, it sounds like you're, you're kind of raw right now. I understand that. Can I point something out that you may not have noticed? Yeah, what? You didn't mention God. Oh, oh, well, I, I just, well, no, 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 don't, no, don't give me Sunday school answers, it's okay. I'm just pointing it out to you. 
that the way you're thinking about your trouble, I don't think is really leaning in on the knowledge that's actually going to get you out of this trouble. Okay? You can really help people there. Or, or sometimes they're going to be talking about God in a way like the, the next couple questions. Is he angry and disproving? Is he casual and permissive? Is he distant and uncaring? So some people will mention God, but they talk about God as if his character were not the biblical God of the Bible, right? So I know God's mad at me, but I know God's mad at me, but, or, on the other hand, I know God just, I, I, I know God wants me to be happy, and, and yet, this isn't working out, and this isn't working out, and so I just made this decision because I know God wants me to be happy. You'll hear that a lot, actually. In, in fact, <laughs> the number one context you will hear that is when you're talking to couples about to divorce, okay? I know God wants me to be happy. Well, where'd you read that, okay? And actually, I say to him, actually, God does want you to be happy, but he wants you to be happy on his terms. He wants you to be happy as he defines it, okay? Then you take him to Psalm 1 or Matthew 5, or you take him to where happiness is talked about in theological categories. So my point to you is this. you got to pay close attention to how people talk about God as clues to what their actual functional beliefs about him are, okay? Also equally important is the affections about God. How do they feel towards God? It amazes me. I have counseled people who know way more theology than me, and they can quote way more verses than me, and they have this really tight, precise understanding of God. And yet, they don't. They, they have no feelings, directive feelings toward Him. Or, or they're angry at Him for different reasons. So, so again, I, I erased it here, but feelings are, are the expression of desires. You remember when I wrote that? It's a phantom word now. I just pointed to it on the board. If I feel angry at God... By the way, what do you think about anger with God? Is it ever right? Is it justifiable? Everyone's like, man, I'm not answering that one. (laughs) Feelings or anger at God is never appropriate. Here's why. Because anger is the emotional expression. It's It's an emotional accusation of wrong. You have wronged me. You have broken some standard. When you get angry at your brother or your spouse or your child, you have felt in some way that they have wronged you. So anger at the Lord is an expression that he has wronged you, which means you're applying a moral framework to him that's not his. Okay? So anger at God's always wrong, but by the way, that doesn't mean you rebuke that immediately in counseling. What you have to do is trace it back. So that feeling, what is he wanting from God that he feels God gypped him off from? So if he's angry at God, just note it and then explore it, okay? Eventually you'll correct it, but don't correct it before you actually gain the the, the insight that you need into what's going on in the person's heart. So how does he feel towards God? Then volitionally, does his life demonstrate a dedication to God? What are his core commitments? You know, you know here, here, here's one of the best gauges for you when you're just initially meeting with someone and getting to know them, or, or really even if you're parenting a teenager or something like that. What you spend your time on is probably the single greatest indicator of what you're committed to. Okay? So we, we talk about this with money, what you spend your money on. Is it, that's true, but a lot of us don't have much money. Okay? But, but all of us have the same amount of time, okay? And so oftentimes with people, I'll just get a lay of the land of their week. What are you doing? Like, you know, how does, how, how does, how does the particular problem of, say, pornography that this guy's coming into, how does that relate to the overall commitments that, that characterize the direction of his life, okay? That's what I'm finding out. And oftentimes, at least in the counseling that I've done, you find that porn is in this larger framework of them just pursuing their own amusements all the time. And so porn is just kind of another key feature of a larger problem, okay? So you have to pay attention to the way their heart is dynamically responding to God. Here's another category. You have to pay attention to how their heart is dynamically responding 
regarding their self. You all have a perception of self that is part of God's design of you. Okay? How do I know this? Did I get this from psychotherapy? From various psychotherapists? No, I got it from Genesis 1. Here's how I get it. Genesis 1, 28, or 27 and 28, then 28. Um, the first conversation that God has with Adam, with humankind. Do you know what the topic of that conversation was? Humankind. It's fascinating. God doesn't say, let me tell you about who I am. And God doesn't say, first, let me tell you about the world. He says, he gives him instruction, right? I have made you to do this, have dominion, be fruitful, be multiply. So again, we already noted the fact that Adam didn't come preloaded with that information. He had to receive instruction from the Lord whose express purpose of that instruction was so that Adam accurately perceived who he was in his role in this new creation. Okay? That's amazing to think about. So there's the Bible saying, what you perceive about yourself can either align with what God says, or it's going to, it's going to swallow some other narrative around you. And believe me, there are many competing narratives for for you to, that, 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 that people tell you about yourself, okay? You want to know mo- one of the most compelling narratives? I, I, I'm, I'm, the teenage example is just in my head right now. So one of the most compelling narratives for a teenage girl is a lure magazine or Seventeen magazine sitting on the, the, the rack as you check out at the grocery store, okay? There's an entire narrative of how they should perceive themselves going right on just in that cover of that magazine, okay? What's the cover of that magazine proclaiming? It's proclaiming what, what the standard of beauty is. And the only reason it sells even a single copy is because people want to be identified with the standards of beauty that are demonstrated on that cover. So what I'm saying to you is there are plenty of narratives that you will read in terms of even movies you watch, Books you read, conversations you have, there's, there's, there, well, we'll get into that with the others thing. But my point is, the way you perceive yourself can either be faithful to Scripture or can have some alternate model. So, regarding self, people operate out of a sense of identity, okay? A perception of who they are, what role they play. You have an opinion about yourself, and furthermore, you measure yourself according to certain values. Okay? So, this works cognitively, effectively, and volitionally. Sorry, I'm doing editing as I go here because I just want to make sure I cover the right things. Cognitively, what do, what do you, you got to know what a person thinks about themselves. What do they believe about themselves? Okay. What's most important to them in their perception of themselves? Is it, is, it, is it their job? I'm a salesman or I'm a professor. Is it their talents? Uh, uh, I'm gifted at this or wish I were gifted at that. Is it, is it their, 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 their sort of their physical makeup? What is it about them that's so important to them? Affectively, this might be the more sort of, this might be the the richer place to go with people I typically find. How do they feel towards themselves? Okay, What what do they feel about themselves? Feelings reveal desires. So, so what you're revealing is what they wish were true of them. I'm always asking people, what do you wish were true of you? What's the ideal you? It's not so I can stroke it or stroke their ego, it's because that can expose to me some things that have captured their hearts, right? What's the ideal you? In fact, you can do a thought experiment right now, guys, regarding yourself. What do you desperately wish were different about yourself? That can show a desire that might have more influence on how you conduct yourself than you actually realize, okay? Some of you wish you were smarter than you are. Some of you wish you were better looking than you are. Some of you wish that you had more time than you are or, or, were, more, or were seen as more expert or authoritative and had more, 
had more clout than you do, okay? All of those, and, and, and when you don't have those things, you feel bad about yourself. That's an indicator of very strong desires that go into a formula of larger problems. Remember our binge eating disorder guy, right? This is, this is sort of the self uh, perception aspect that's an ingredient in the formula of why he pursued that particular sinful route. And then volitional. How do their actions reflect their beliefs and values about self? What is their pattern of behavior, their weekly use of time, their interactions with others, the media that they take in? How does that reinforce those self-perceptions? Okay. And then let's move on to others here, okay? Because here's what, I, here's what I was already jumping ahead to a little bit. This, in, in, in a fallen world, this is largely shaped by this when it should be shaped by this. Does that make sense? So how others treat you and what they say is attractive and what they say is worthy of commitment and what they say is believable has a huge influence on what you think of as believable. In fact, the, the, the sort of business dynamics guru, Jim Rohn, he's not a believer, but he says some pretty good things sometimes. He has this great phrase that he's always being quoted as, you are the average of the five people you spend most time with. Okay? You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. What he's acknowledging is the incredible influence that others can have on your perception of the world. And if you don't like that quote, here's a more faithful quote from Baptist theologian Andrew Fuller, pioneer of the modern missions movement, by the way. The company we keep and the books we read insensibly form us into the same likeness. The company we keep and the books we read, he adds that in, insensibly form us into their image. The key, the, the key term there is insensibly. What does that mean? That's an older word, but what does it mean? Yeah, unknowingly. This is, this is really important for us to recognize, okay? We could, if, if I had enough space on this board, I could, I could draw little dynamic hearts here because this thing is going on a thousand million times over here, okay? And their dynamic heart shape has a direct influence on the shape that your heart takes, even when it's imperceptible, okay? So the average teenager in 2017 has a very different understanding of sex than the average teenager in the 1950s. Why? Is it that is it that people get behind lecterns and give much more compelling arguments in 2017 than they do in, two, in than, than they do in, ni- in the 1950s? Is it that they're explicitly cognitively instructed? No. What is it? Everything from the stories we tell ourselves to the music we listen to, to to, to the billboards we see around us, everything is insensibly shaping an understanding of sexuality that is totally different than it was in the 1950s, okay? And so what this means is, as stewards of the fact that we are dynamically influencing each other, this is the importance of of doing church well, right? Of having a community of the Word, a community of faith, where we are increasingly shaped here dynamically by the perspective of God revealed in the world so that when we influence other people, we're reinforcing what's good and undermining what's bad, right? Do you know how crazy a teenager feels when they're the only virgin in their senior year of high school, if they're the only Christian or the only virgin or the only one who has a sex? They, they, they have a, they, it's, it's a lot harder for them to not feel insane than if they have even two or three friends or if they even have a group, a community of church behind them, that they may not be in the high school, but they're reinforcing dynamically through their own life and their own living this this ethic of God that says sexuality was designed to be gloriously enjoyed in the context of a marriage between one man and one woman. 
So we influence each other. There are tons of verses that say this that we could quote, but let me just kind of walk you through the, uh, these categories of questions so they, c- they can be helpful for you in your ministry. Here's what you're really getting at. You can write this in the margin. It, it spans all three columns. This is the main thing I want you to get. You always need to know who are the significant voices in this person's life. Who are the significant voices in this person's life? Significant voices can be actual people, or they can be expressed through media and books. Because, by the way, do you know that people write those books? Okay, It's funny. We think of media as like a thing separate from relationship. No, media is a means of relationship. That, That really changes the game when you think about it. If, 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 if your teenage daughter is listening to, oh, wow, I am so uncool. I don't even know anybody. <laughs> Beyonce, I know that. I don't know any of her music. But if she's listening to Beyonce again and again and again, there's not a personal back and forth relationship that she has with Beyonce. But there's a, you better believe there's a one directional relationship of influence. So in other words, the things that Beyonce draws attention to the interpretations that she puts on things, the things that she presents as attractive and desirable will have a dynamic impact on this. So just so you all know, I don't know enough about Beyonce and I'm not telling you to stop listening to her. Maybe you should stop listening to her. I don't know. That's not my point. My point is Christians have to be aware that what we engage with in terms of media, we have to engage with critically and not passively. Okay? Passive reception of the perspective of others means that this is conformed along the lines of them. You don't do passive reception. You do critical engagement. You're rejecting some things. You're you're okay with some things, and you're disgusted by other things, right? And you're always just navigating all of those things. So who are the significant voices in a person's life, and what are they telling them? Cognitively, um, uh, how do the beliefs of a particular Uh, person affect the person that we have here? Affectively, how do they respond emotionally to other other people? Whose opinions seem most important to them? Who are the people that bother them the most or make them the most happy or that they gravitate towards? You have to to know that and then know what they're telling them. And then volitionally, how do their commitments reflect the commitments of those around them? Let me give you an example and then we'll, we'll move to our last category. I was once counseling a young girl who was cutting herself. And um, I feel like I should say this caveat. By the way, I never counsel females without another female present, so I don't want to imply that it was just the two of us. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I was counseling a, a, a teenage girl who was cutting herself, and we were talking about self-perception. We were talking about her perception of God. We were talking about you know, God's word is the authority over her life and all the rest of the stuff. And <clears throat> it became clear to me after a while that the majority of her waking hours were spent listening to, um, this was years ago, I don't even know if this is popular anymore, but a type of music called emo and screamo, which apparently, uh, I, I, so, so, so part of my job, I think, as, as, as the counselor here was, I asked her, hey, get, bring, in, bring, bring to me your favorite artists. I want to know who they are. And I would love to see some of the lyrics and just listen to the songs with you. I want to see why is this so compelling to you, okay? So we listened a little bit. I read through the lyrics. There aren't many lyrics to emo and screamo. It's basically screaming into microphones, okay? But but here's the deal. Long story short, this, this brand of music, this type of music, was always the topic of every song was the angst and the awfulness of life. And it was this sort of rage. It was almost this self-indulgence in the, it's savoring the sorrow of what it means to be alive kind of thing. And it's this rage at it. So if you think about it, that's a testimony. That's a dynamic testimony of how the world works being constantly repeated and reinforced in a particularly beautiful or compelling way via music. And so I walked her through that and I said, you know what we need to do? I want you to do a two-week fast from all emo and all screamo. And in fact, I don't want you listening to music as much. Let's replace that with 
this type of behavior and this type of behavior and this type of behavior. You would have thought that I, I, I told a pastor that, that the Bible was, was fake or something like that. She went crazy, okay? She really didn't like it. She was very resistant to it. And eventually we incrementally got her to do it, but, but as, long as, those, as long as that testimony was the primary testimony to her, my work with her was very limited, and so was the, all the other pastors' work with her, and so was her family's work with her. So hear me say this. I'm not blaming her cutting on music. Don't, don't hear me say that. I'm saying when you're looking at a particular problem, you have to look at the things that are reinforcing bad things, bad dynamic perspectives, and undermine those things. And then finally to circumstances. Basically, people are shaped by the events and the situations in which they find themselves. They're always responding to what's happening to them. And there's just two main categories that you need to think in when you're trying to think about people's circumstances. There's significant events in their life, and then there's just sort of the the basic background uh, situation that they're in, the background static to life, okay? So by significant events, I just mean the things that if I were to ask you right now, what are the what are the 10 most important moments of your life? You could probably come up with three or four immediately and then just with a some thinking come up with the rest, okay? But they can be bad things or they can be good things. They can be when you came to Jesus. They could be when you got married. But for a lot of people, they can be when my uncle first abused me, or when my parents got a divorce, when we lost my brother, okay? Those, those events, significant events, milestone type of events, are shaping of the influence of how the heart's responding. But, but the more important category and the one that we'll sort of close with is, what is the basic, uh, uh, what is the basic situation this person is in, the era of life that they're in, sort of? So there's a world of difference between counseling a woman in her early 80s who was recently widowed and who's adult children don't live in the city and she just had to move into a nursing home that situation that circumstance is very different than a homeschooling mom of six in her 40s okay the difficulties and pressures of this are different than the difficulties and pressures of this what might you imagine would be circumstantial pressures that would have an influence on the heart for the 80-year-old widow? Fear. fear. Why? Fear of what? That's right. Loneliness, isolation, fear of being forgotten and neglected. That's huge. The, the, the homeschool mom of six is probably wishing for that problem. <laughs> okay? Okay? But nevertheless, that's really hard. What other things are, 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 are probably features of this? One more thing. Yeah, end of life issues. What do you mean? Tease it out. That's exactly right. Legacy issues. The, 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 the homeschool mom of six is not thinking about legacy. She's thinking about what? Survival. survival. Very good. <laughs> what are the unique pressures there? You say survival. Unpack that. What do you mean? Just the sheer weight of having so much more to do than capacity to do it, right? Which is added to the fear of failing her children and equipping them to be able to make it in a very hostile world, right? So all I'm saying is not that circumstances determine the shape of the heart, but you better counsel those ladies with an eye. Both of them can be depressed, by the way. Say they both come into you for depression. I'm trying to give you a perspective that consider circumstances where you're not going to counsel them in the exact same way, are you? No, you're not going to. So be mindful of how that influences them, okay? All right, so I'll I'll just let you read the questions that help you get to circumstances on your own there. But that's basically it, folks. I, uh, we're over our time, but we have, we do have some time for Q&A, and I'm going to ask the first question. Okay, because this question was asked me between times and I really want all of you to to hear this because it's really important to complete this model a little bit. I had the question of what do you do 
when there's a physiological aspect to the problem, a physical part of the problem. The specific case that I was being asked about was in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So, so here's a reality, guys. I, I've counseled a number of combat veterans. They come over, they have a very, very, very difficult time readjusting to life here. They have a very difficult time with their emotions. There's a lot of fear and what might surprise you. There's a lot of anger and outrage. They, they, they struggle with sort of invasive thoughts and emotions, nightmares. The flashbacks is not just a joke for like a goof comedy of that weird vet guy. I hate that character. I hate, I hate it when there's characters like that. That's a, that's a, that's a very distressing thing that, that, that we shouldn't make fun of, right? Those are genuine things. Is that merely a spiritual problem? If we're treating it only as a spiritual problem, then what we're saying is we just basically need to make him stop believing the wrong things, wanting the wrong things, and then acting in the wrong way. Okay. And yet, do we want to say that it's, a, that it's just a physical problem? Should he just go to the VA? and have the right meds and the right therapies adjusted and he'll be fine? Does that problem have nothing to do with his perspective of God, his perception of himself, his perception of the world and circumstances, even the way he relates and perceives relationships with others? Friends, the Bible gives us a very clear understanding of human beings as... Here's, this is going to sound fancy, but it's not, okay? We are psychosomatic unities, okay? Unity. That sounds really fancy. It's not. Psyche is the root word for soul. Soma is the root word for body. What that means is simply this in his glorious design as part of creation, not a part of the fall, as part of creation, God made us to have souls that operate in coordination with the body's operation. It's woven together. It's mysterious how it links together, but it's glorious and it's good. And we have to acknowledge both of them. Okay? By the way, this is God's ideal for humanity because in heaven, guess what's going to be true of you? You're not going to be a spirit zipping around. Okay? As awesome as that would be, it actually wouldn't be awesome, okay? You are going to be an embodied being in heaven. That means for eternity, your spiritual functioning will always have a neurological, physical correlate, okay? You know what that means? Every time you have a thought, every time you feel a feeling, every time you have a desire, every time you make a choice, that is a spiritual, moral agent created in the image of God operating, and the way you operate is there's neurological pathways that are firing up there to the point where if, if you had someone open your head up and ask you to do something as simple as recite the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you're reciting it and they took an electric probe and put it on a certain part of your brain up front, you'd get to about C. A, B, C. Dude, it's the alphabet. Say the alphabet. I can't. It's because there, there's this amazing wiring of God in terms of how we work. Now, <clears throat> we always want to honor the fact that the image of God is, the, is the, the correlative function of both of those things. We, we live in a society that doesn't believe in this part of us. Okay, It believes only in this part of us. It's called neurological determinism or biological determinism, okay? What it means is if you have problems in human life, you have to find the physical problem that's going on and just offer a physical remedy, okay? That's not going to solve anything, okay? It might, it might relieve some symptoms, but it's not ultimately going to get the heart to be more shaped after God's heart. That's the standard of health from Scripture, okay? So... If I were to diagram where the body fits in with this, I've thought, of, I've thought about this a lot. Here's the best I can come up with. You might think it's really cheesy, but I think it's actually pretty cool, okay? 
I think to diagram the body, I would just say it's the whiteboard itself. I'm not going to draw something separate. Okay? The whiteboard was necessary for the pen to have something to write on. Okay? And so this diagram of spiritual functioning could not visually be in front of you were it not for that whiteboard. The whiteboard is important. Without it, I can't draw that. Without a body, you actually don't exist, okay? Except for in the intermediate state, <laughs> which is actually you waiting for your resurrected body. You notice that the, all the saints, the, the little glimpses of where the saints are as they're wait, as, as, as they're. Uh, awaiting the resurrection is they're longing for it. They're wanting the resurrection. When are you going to resurrect us and end this thing, right? So here's the point. We, when we are counseling people and thinking about the care of people, we have to take seriously that sin's corruption occurs to both the soul, we already talked about that ad nauseum, as well as the body. There's a brokenness that can be to us, Okay. And for those guys coming home from being in war, I want you to think about this theologically. They were psychosomatic unities, body-soul unities, that were designed to live in a garden where they could see God with their own eyes, be naked in front of each other, and still be perfectly safe. Death wasn't even a concept for them. They were not designed for death. And so post-fall, you live in a world where Death reigns, and you as a civilian have little touches with death here and there. Somebody you love dies, you get sick. I think all of your deficiencies are in some way echoes of death, right? But you take a guy and you put them on the front lines where they're not just casually seeing death occasionally, they are seeing it explicitly exchanged intentionally. They're, they're seeing friends destroyed in front of their eyes. They're dealing out death themselves with their own fingers. And they come back here, back into this world where there's an illusion of safety that death really isn't that big of a thing and we try to avoid it. And they can't fit back in. They can't fit back in. And they have their nightmares and all the rest of that stuff. So how do you help someone like that? It's way too long to answer here in terms of the specifics of PTSD, but let me just give you the categories regarding this. How you help someone like that is, I just had a guy in my office two weeks ago who was in the, a, a combat vet who was in the middle of an episode, and it was really scary, and he was a threat to himself, and he was a threat to his wife, and he, couldn't, he, could, he just couldn't control his emotions or his body or himself, and how you help a guy like that is not, okay, I'm taking you to the emergency room, see you later. Jeez, I'm glad they can help him. And it's also not, hey man, don't you know that God is creating a world that's not going to have any death anymore? Calm down. In that moment, you know how you help him? You say, let's get you to the hospital. And when you're stabilized, we have a lot of work to do to help you continue to renew your mind, renew your heart, believe what God says about this world. In other words, you're giving them... That, that brush with death that they have, you're, you're building an entire biblical framework around them that helps them make sense of it in ways that they aren't making sense of it right now. Like, and I'll, and I'll leave the example with this and then leave some time for questions. Like, that safety that you long for is not going to be found in the old illusion that you lived in before you went overseas. That safety that you long for is a promise of a world to come. And what you need to do is adjust your expectations of this life to where you can patiently wait on that as a good value that God agrees with. You should want that safety. You shouldn't want a world where people get blown up. That's a good thing. But for now, he's left you in a world where that's the case. And he's done that for the reason of you being a blessing to others by means of proclaiming the glories of who he is. And so you, you, again, so that's a really simplistic way of saying you're giving them a, a framework for which to understand this new revelation of death that he has. Does that make sense? Let me start with any questions on what I just said there, okay, since it's just a fresh topic. Should I give you another question? Here's another common question I get when I say that. Well, what about psychiatric medications then, Okay. 
there, we have to answer this carefully in, in, in two main parts, okay? Here's the first one. We live in a culture that, that again, is bi that, that only believes in this part. So it's biological determinism. Added to that, we live in a consumeristic culture where industries make tons of money off of the sales of these things. Add to that a healthcare system that frankly stinks, okay? And I'm not, I'm not criticizing any particular politician. I'm just saying, I don't know if you realize this, but the, the average psychiatrist to keep the lights on has to see six to seven patients an hour, okay? So you know what that means? You come in off the street, you get diagnosed, you get prescribed in a, what is that, eight, nine minute window? That's, that's, that's going to leave room for all kinds of havoc, okay? So, so here's my point. We got to acknowledge that our, our culture is always going to knee-jerk think that medicine's going to solve it, okay? So we're, we're, we're opposed to that, all right? There's another aspect in which I think we have to acknowledge our, our, our doctrine of sin says that we can be corrupt in the soul. I think we can also be corrupted in the body in ways that are difficult for us to even understand. Okay? And so, the responsible use of medication as our attempt as the image of God to have dominion over our world and lessen the effects of the fall, I think is, is in principle a legitimate thing. Now, in practice, that's where, it, honestly, there, there's just a thousand questions you'd have to answer in practice, but I'm just saying in principle, okay? So, then somebody, some, I sometimes will get a follow-up. So, are you for meds or against meds? I'm like, you kind of missed the point of, of what I'm saying. You can't have a wholesale for and you can't have a wholesale against. This is what Christian discernment is in terms of making decisions and weighing those things, but, but I, what I'm trying to give you a, a, a framework for is in principle, okay? Yes? If you're working with um, a veteran like that, and they're, going, they're working with the PA office, and you're trying to build up this framework, biblical framework for them to navigate, them, and you have the VA doing therapy, like reparative therapy and exposure therapy, which is kind of can tear down physical, how would you approach it? That's a great question. I have always found that in situations where the person is getting assistance from someone else too, especially if they're my church member, I'm a pastor at Clifton Baptist Church, I have found that if I humbly approach the, the therapist and just say, hey man, I would, just, I would love to get a lay of the land of what you're doing. You know, a lot of what you're doing I'm sure is really helpful for him. There's some things... I may disagree with, but I'm not coming in to I'm, I'm not coming in to talk to you. I'm not coming in to sort of combat with you. I really just need to help him think about this uh, in his in in his walk with the Lord, and especially psychiatrists are usually r really open to that. I found because they know what they're trying to do, and they know it's kind of different from what you're trying to do. But even if you can't do that, or you don't have the time to do that, what I do say to someone is. Hey man, part of our meetings together is we're going to just, I want you to debrief me on what you covered in therapy. It's not so that I make that person evil or whatever it is, but I have to help you discern what, what's coming at you that's legitimate and squares with a biblical worldview and what's coming at you that's actually unhelpful, right? So, so I one time had a counselee, um, it, wasn't, it wasn't PTSD, but it was very similar, you know, related to it, who was, who was being told by a therapist um, when you're feeling that overwhelming urge and that overwhelming anger, just instead of yelling at your wife, go upstairs and, and beat the junk out of a pillow and yell at the pillow, okay? I mean, real, beating up a pillow isn't sin, I don't think, right? That pillow doesn't have feelings. It's not created in the image of God. But, but my question is, what... What view of man, what assumption is behind that advice? And what the assumption is, is when you feel emotions, the expression of it directed at an external object is necessary for processing that emotion. What would you say about that biblically? 
I don't think that squares with the understanding of what self-control is, right? There are times where you're hacked off and you're angry and you know what you need to do? You need to tell yourself, it's stupid for me to be angry right now. Instead of direct it somewhere, right? So, so it, that's an example of, I have always found it far more helpful rather than going combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the person's other alternate thing is really just paint for them the biggest, richest, most colorful vision of the Bible that I can and show them how alive it is and the case makes itself. And I'll often have counselees come and say to me, man, I just, I feel like you get it actually in a way that this other guy doesn't. And that's not to stroke my ego, right? Because I, I actually don't, I wish I were a better counselor than I am. It's not anything about me. It's about, I honestly believe that this Bible describes in a more accurate and thorough way what they're experiencing than any of these particular theories that are applied. Amen. Yeah. Yes. Any suggestions for how to effectively implement this model in the disciple-making ministry of the, the local church? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question. The back, of that, the, the back of my book basically has four tasks for counseling ministry, but you can use that in discipleship and other things. Um, I, here's my main suggestion to you, because I'm thinking about how this relates to preaching, how this relates to teaching. I actually have sort of composed in my setting a, 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 a way of conducting a Bible study that, that considers the dynamic aspects of the heart. But here it is in a nutshell. All you need to do, guys, when you are preparing a sermon, when you are preparing a lesson, when you are preparing to have a conversation with your adult child about something that you're concerned about in their life, just realize as you're making your application, you have to instruct their mind, you have to appeal to what they're wanting, and you have to call them to a decision. The, the, all three of those things are a helpful aspect of kind of moving someone along in terms of the application of, of God's Word. So I, I know that's super generic. That's really all we have time for. I would just say in your application, just maybe even test yourself. Where do you tend to go naturally? Maybe you think your application is just telling them more things. Maybe you think your application is just trying to get them to feel a certain way. Maybe your application tends to be just a, a, an immediate decision that they need to make, it, where it, whereas it needs to be all of them. Good. Other thoughts, questions? Wow, two hands. Elders get the uh, get um, priority. As far as this model goes with young children, how would you maybe convey some of these concepts and things in a way that they would be able to understand? Yeah. You know, I have young children, so I have to think freshly about this all the time. And I never sit down and draw out the dynamic heart model and say, this is... A... <laughs> you know, honestly, for them, I've just found the richest in route to be here. So in other words, kids, kids, part of being a kid is you just know what you're feeling in the moment and that is the reality that everybody has to conform to. So I just make that, I just make that connection I made earlier for them. This has been the richest thing for me is that feelings are an indicator of desires. And so what I'll say to him, him, I have girls and boys and I immediately am thinking of one of my sons in particular. <laughs> What I say to him is, hey, bud, you're going crazy right now. You're, you're, you're really upset right now because you're wanting something. What are you wanting? And there are times where he can tell that, tell me and express that, and then I talk to him about what it means to trust God with that desire. There are other times he has no clue. I mean, he, just, he doesn't even have the capacity to do it. So then I, as the dad, have to direct him, this is what I think you're wanting, okay? In fact, the fact that you treated your sister that way and you got mad at your mom for that particular thing shows you're wanting this. I said, let me just ask you, is that more important than, and then you can cite any number of biblical principles, is that more important than trusting your dad to give you what you actually need? And what I found actually, that doesn't make discipline easy, but it makes it more hearty. It makes it, it, makes it dig down a little bit deeper to where I'm not just focusing on their behavior, I'm focusing on their heart. So you could kind of do any one of these things, but a kid, if, if you did the choice to commitment thing, what do your choices reflect that you're committed to? Like, uh, what's, what, what? You know, but, but, but it's easier concept to say, what do you want right now? In, in the counseling ministry, 
would that be appropriate to maybe instruct parents through that model too then? Yeah. To be able to have them discipline more effectively. Yeah, yeah. In counseling, yes, but I but we we do it more broadly in terms of our training at our church where we're just talking to parents constantly about like address the heart. Don't address the behaviors, you know. Yeah. Similar kind of question, but I was gonna ask, would you actually draw this in a counseling situation? You said that you wouldn't with children. There are times I do if I think it's really important for them to understand the nuances. But most of the time, it's just, you'll see in the back of that book if you have it, it's just the framework of questions that I'm asking them. And then that helps me load biblical truth specifically into the categories of their experience. So most of the time I'm not drawing it, but occasionally I will, especially if they're telling me things like, I know God is sovereign, but I'm always so scared. Okay, And I can t- we just talk about the connection point between those two things. Yes. It seems like as you're describing this, you're generally making a progression from cognition to affection to volition. What could you give an example of how it might go in a different direction? What an insightful question. That is a great question. Honestly, I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a very insightful question. I don't, I, I'm, I, I've, 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 tried, I've answered it in like 50 different ways that probably all contradict each other, okay? But, but here's what I've come to know for sure, okay? Uh, this is not, I, maybe, the, the, for the diagramming purposes, we made it three different things just so you could get it as a teaching model, but this is all one thing. Keep that in mind, okay? So you can think of it as three different perspectives or angles on one thing. It's similar to the fact that this lectern has, um, has dimension to it. It has, what is this, width, height, and depth, okay? Three different dimensions, but it's all one, it's all one physical object. That's how you think of the heart there. And so, I, you, know, you know, dissecting these out too much actually leads us into quandaries that we can't really answer, Okay. So let me add one thing, though, and this is what you're getting at that I really appreciated. Cognition, as I read the Bible, I think cognition, I think it's king in the sense that it sets the rules, right? You don't really have access to these without this. And so, notice my hesitation here. I think what I'm trying to guard against is there are some psychotherapies that try to access this by bypassing this. So, in other words, they'll, they'll, they'll guide you through certain re-experiencing of things to get you to feel certain emotions. Now, that has to do with their understanding between the conscious and the subconscious, which is a whole other topic we didn't even get into. But, <clears throat> but my point is, you really... You really can't change your desires and the feelings that flow from those desires without addressing your cognitive conception of things. You just really can't do it. In terms of the choices that you make, those choices only make sense as you believe a certain thing about how the world does. So, so I'm sorry that I don't have something like ringingly clear there, but I think it's important to note, to, to note you can't bifurcate them and cognition is always a very vital and necessary part of, of any instruction. Whereas I don't know if I'd say the same thing about affections in that, here's, here's an example. Have you ever gone to do your devotions, you know, your quiet time with the Lord, and it's the last thing you want to do? It's the, last time you feel, it's the last thing you feel like doing, if you're honest with yourself. Anybody been there, or am I just the only pagan in the room? Okay, okay. The last thing you feel like doing... Well, in that moment, what do you do? You open your Bible anyway. You make the choice to open your Bible because you believe that God's words are the source of life. And then as you read, what happens? Sometimes your affections rise, and, and, and it's just a wonderful thing. Other times, you read it and you get done. Again, maybe I'm the only pagan in the room. You get done, and you're like, oh, that, was, that felt pointless. But it wasn't pointless. It was not pointless. So we can't judge everything based on, there, there's an immediacy to the feelings that can, that can throw us off. That's why I kind of put a crown here. But again, I might change my mind on that. 
good. One, one more, yes. Uh, referring to the question of children uh, and helping the establish for children and youth, how would you, uh, using this framework, help those that have been diagnosed with uh, autism, some mm. autism, or uh, attention deficit disorder? Brother, that is an excellent question. And actually, that's two separate questions. Um, <laughs> autism. Autism is one of those conditions. There's kind of a spectrum of clarity as to the body's involvement in something, right? There's sort of things that are really clear, so clearly physiological. And then there, there are things that are less clear about the physiolog- physiology. Autism is like boom. As cl- it's, it's similar to Down syndrome in that it's just it's, it's demonstrably clear. There's some corruptive effect to this child's body that is, that is conditioning them. Well, actually, maybe Down syndrome is all the way here, and then autism is more like right there. But my point is it's, it's, it's just really clear, okay? So what you need to do there is you realize because they are a precious, precious image bearer of God, they have the dignity of having this framework. They're made, they're made to think and feel and want or and choose. But those capacities, the bodily capacities, are hindered in some way. So the best way to love an autistic child is to know the level of capacities that he's capable of. And then lovingly disciple him to follow God according to those capacities. And and what that means is, as parents and as as fellow members of the church taking care of autistic uh, children, we, we don't talk to them and we don't treat them in a way that puts expectations that go beyond their capacities because that will only add guilt and it will only add anger and frustration, right? You actually free them to be more fully who they are in Christ by being serious about the, their incapacity. So you just got to learn that stuff. And honestly, there's tons of people who are unbelievers who have made some really good observations on the nature of autism and on the sort of the learning styles versus the socialization and just all the rest of the stuff that it's helpful to read. I, don't, I mean, we have families in our church that, that have children with these things, and they're, they're voracious readers. Why? Because the mom and dad want to have dominion over the knowledge that they need in order to help their kid, right? So that's what I would say there. With ADD, that one's harder, right? I I do think that there are genuine physiological conditions, I think in large part caused by different cultural factors around here. I do think that, that, that we could classify as having, making it harder for people to, kids to focus or pay attention. Now, it's overdiagnosed like crazy because of the, because of the factors that I said before. But with ADD on this spectrum, it's not he- here where Down syndrome is. It's not here where autism is in terms of clarity. It's more like here, okay? So part of it is got to know the kid. You've got to have a good doctor that's not just going to, like, write things off and try to get you out of his office with holding a prescription. You, you, it, it's a process. It's a difficulty. But I'm just answering you in theory I'm, I'm open to the idea that some brains have less developed executive functioning or ability to focus, basically. And, and it might be helpful to look at different therapies for that. But never straying from the fact that there's responsibility going on. Okay? There's, a, there's a moral agent functioning that should be held to standards of morality. Okay, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>